started again. And where we are going to pick up is we're looking at this example of uh, basically trying to uh, read some image uh, data, a file, like a little photograph, and apply it to a panel. And we sort of started by going through and selecting the image file. We got that with file path and file from path. And then there were a couple of nodes. I'm sure to revise this and my uh, map to sort of reflect what it is now. It's image read from file, which lets it know that it's a bitmap image of some type. And then image pixels, which returns a row, a list of rows of, it's really the color values. Okay, and that's where we're going to start. So once we get those color values, we ought to be in pretty good shape. But we're going to think about doing some adjustments based on whether we need to flip them or what happens to, to kind of make that image apply right. Let's go ahead and go back over here for a second. You'll see that here we have our list of different color values. They seem to be uh, in I would I guess would be row order, but let's just kind of check this to be certain. Because I have 10 by 10, it's a little bit hard to tell in terms of what's going on because you can sort of see there's 10 and there's going to be 10. It might be column. What I can do just as a starting point to test that is if I change that to like five or something like that, let's just sort of see what the sampling does in terms of I think it's going to be groups of uh, the X samples, but we'll see. I just want to see if that changes to be 10 groups of 5 or 5 groups of 10. Okay, it looks like it's 10 groups of 5. Okay, so the way I would read that is that basically this 5 is going to be the number of cells across and 10 is going to be the number of rows. Okay, just to kind of keep track of it. Was that? So, so, so 10 rows in the y direction and five chunks across. So five across in the x-axis and 10 in the y-axis. So 10, 10 rows and five columns. Right, right, right. Yes? How come our points didn't change? What points didn't change? Wait. Well, let's see what's going on. It should have changed. Let's see what's going on there. You're coming on down there. You still got the five. I think it changed here. It did change there, but not in the preview. Mm -hmm. That's kind of odd. I don't know what to tell you about that. It didn't change for you either? Yeah, it's doing the same thing, but it's, the list is changing. Yeah. Interesting. I am not sure why. That's kind of interesting. I got to think about why it did <laughs> the, yeah. the The preview in Dynamo doesn't seem to be changed. The preview in Revit seems to be changing. That's kind of odd. No, you're right there. Same sort of thing here. I gotta see if there's anything, I could have something else lying around inside that script that's generating those points, but I gotta think about what it could be. So we've got the quads, all that type stuff. It changed for me. I do not know. Okay. Let's go ahead and work with these colors. So here's the deal. We're going to ultimately use this thing called override color in view. And what override color in view does, I'm going to ignore the flipping for right now, is it's going to take all these different adaptive components. You can sort of see the list of adaptive components and see how that list of adaptive components is a nice flat list. It doesn't really have any hierarchy to it. It is just, just a single layer to it. Okay. So, if we go ahead and we want to colorize those elements, okay, what we're going to do is take the list of colors over here, okay, but we won't be able to apply them quite like this. We're going to have to flatten the list so that the flat list applies in both cases. It's sort of a single <coughs> list. So I'm going to grab those colors. Now what I'm going to do starting is I'm just going to flatten the list by putting it to that last flatten right here. And then we'll apply it. Okay, and what I'm doing right now is I'm just leaving out the chopping, the transposing, and the reversing. We're just going to apply it so it's just exactly the way it was. Okay, so let's take a look and see what happens. <coughs> I come on over here. It's a little hard to tell what's going on, okay, because it's uh, not very fine. 
Let me go ahead and I'll just sort of up it a little bit in terms of giving myself a little more data to work with. <coughs> and I'll warn you, when you up the data, it actually has quite a few more components to work with, so it'll take longer to generate. But let's go, I'm going to go for 20 just so I can really see what's going on there. Okay, it's taking a while because now as opposed to doing 50 things, it's doing 200 things. So I have to regenerate them. What's that? What image did you choose? I used, uh, it's this me and two dogs. Oh. Your image, well, yeah. You a little bit different. But I wanted to get a sense, did it lay on properly or did it flip itself? What happened to it? <coughs> Okay, it's a working and a working and a working. Okay, I'm going to again just say there's something about my geometry which is so tight that it won't do the last one. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. Something's very strange in there in terms of as I look at my, it looks like I'm sort of interleaving in sort of a funny way. And that, has to, that could have to do with the chopping and all that type of stuff. It's really, you know, as I look at kind of how it's every other one, it looks like sort of, yeah, it's almost like the end of the row is continuing. Yes, it's. Yeah, clearly it's, it's interleaved in the wrong way. It's like it's oriented to, yeah, it's like weaving around in some sort of funny way. So let's see if we can sort of sort it out a little bit in terms of what's going on. Let's try, because it all gets down to chopping and stuff like that. Since I didn't chop, let's see what's going on here. If I take those colors and oppose to uh, just kind of laying them in there, let me try this. Let me instead go through and transpose them, and then take the transpose list and see if that makes any difference. And that's a little bit better. At least it looks like I'm sort of in the right territory. <laughs> and here's what's going on. Okay. So if I look at that photo, it looks like I got all the white cells over here. I got some kind of reddish cells here. Got that brown back over there in the corner. If I try to contrast that actually with the photo itself. My guess about what's going on is what I think of at the bottom of the photos over here, that kind of pink area is probably my head with the dogs on my lap, and that kind of light blue area over there I think is where the window is. <coughs> Something like that. So it looks like it's actually not too bad off, in this case, just sort of transposing it. Although you're never quite sure what's going on with the order. So let's just go ahead and try kind of a simple thing to it and see if we can uh, even though I think it's laid in kind of a funny way there. Let's see if we can make it like make more sense. For example, right now we have this list of columns. Watch it, let's do this. Let me take out this, I'm going to say the transpose, and then flip the list, and do that flip list over here. What I'm doing is basically just taking that transpose out of the picture. <coughs> so I'm doing a flip. OK, it looks like it did kind of an OK thing here. What it did is, you see by flipping it, it switched the blue area up to that corner as opposed to this corner. Again, if I take out the resist, or reverse, okay, it'll flip the image the other way. So it seems like we're sort of having control over flipping it. The whole fact that it's rotated is a little bit gronky in terms of what's going on. Let's see what we could do with that. Mine works if I go transpose, reverse, transpose, black. Yeah, that's what I said. That works the best. Yeah. Okay, so transpose, reverse, then yeah. transpose yeah. that, and then flat it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Let's check it. And that works the best. Okay, well, I have a little interleaving. I think that has to do with sort of the way my numbers are structured over here. Are you still doing 10 by 10, or what are you doing? I have 20 by 20. Okay, so I think because the grid is even, I have 45 by 45. Oh, interesting. Yeah, then it doesn't matter about the order because you don't get the sort of weird and deleting. I think my problem here is when I follow that logic, I'm getting half the row on one side and half the row on the other side. So it's just kind of shopping. It's not sort of mapping it in there, right? So 
we'll keep on playing with this. It's just, uh, I don't wanna, I'll, I'll figure out the precise logic in here. For me, it looks like if I don't do the transpose, if I just do the reverse, it does a little bit better. But, well, that's interesting. It flipped it a different way now. Because <laughs> I did the reverse before I did the transpose. Interesting. So if I do that, and if I just took out the transpose, let's try that. I again have the interleaving. So I definitely need the transpose to get it mapped in there. Because really, what it, it's just this whole sense of, and we're going to have to do a little list manipulation. I'm not going to like, I'll figure it out as what's going on with this, because it does have changed a little bit. But it's all about just getting the list of colors the way we got fed, and the list of panels in the order that it is in the right order. And there's a little out of sync with each other. So. We might have to do just a little um, messing around with our transposing and our list manipulation to be get it to go through and do the right thing. So for me, it definitely works, at least in my example, to go through that I have to do the final transpose. Okay. But in general, that's kind of a fun thing to do. These values you're picking up, they're really kind of interesting <coughs> in that these values, you know, right now we're just sort of mapping the color. Okay, and that's kind of good. We're just sort of grabbing all these different RGB values. That's kind of good. It turns out values can actually be grabbed. We can not only grab the color, but for example, we could go through and actually grab either the RGB value, the hue, we could do the saturation, we could do the brightness, we can grab any of those different numbers and use those to map too. So if you didn't want to have a flat surface back here, but you actually want to have something that was like embossed or somehow had a little variation in the surface, let's just talk about how you do that. <coughs> let's see what I got over here. If I type RGB over in my search, I have color by ARGB. That's for defining a color. Let's, oh, hang on. What do I want to do here? Let me say hue. Gives the hue value for this color. Let me see uh, the brightness. Brightness for the color. Let me go to my color functions. So I get the hue, I get the degree of red, take care, I get the alpha, I can do the color range. Let me, for example, get the hue. The hue is kind of an interesting one. That's sort of where you are on that kind of red to green sort of thing, as opposed to the brightness. So if I choose the hue function, where'd it go? What I can do is feed it a list of different colors. Let's take a look. So it's going to go ahead and grab just a whole list of different colors. And with my list of different colors now, I could go ahead and set some parameter back here on the surface. So for example, one of the parameters available out here on the surface is, I choose one of my guys. Okay, there's a height parameter. So if I want to go through and start adjusting the heights so they either fit that color value or kind of a scaled version of that, what I can do is say element set parameter value. My name. I can take all my elements down here, grab those values. I need to tell it what the name is, and it looks like it's height, so I can just put that in as a little code block if I want. Okay, and now what it's gonna do is adjust the height of all those things, all those different panels, based on the color. And this is where it can sort of get interesting because you can come up with all sorts of abstract things. You can sort of grab the colors, or we can change something about the pattern, the size of the aperture. You can make all these almost like comic strip op art sort of effects where you take a photo effect and you translate it into like dots on the surface. Something like that. It's really kind of cool. What kind of error are you? Oh, I'm getting an error too. Let's see what we got here. Oh, I got that. Can't make that. Well, let's see what else I got here.
Looks like it's okay for me now. I was wondering if maybe it got some zeros in there. You'll see over here, I now have this uh, kind of very funny version of it where certain colors are higher. So what do you got there? Elements set parameter by name. Okay, it's getting a bunch of nulls. So let's see, we got the uh, elements. Okay, that should be fine. We have the uh, parameter values. What do you got there? We got the height, got that. And then list, transform. Oh, what we have to do is go ahead and get one more function there. It's called color.hue. So come on over here, because that's what's going to pull the value out. I don't know. OK, so grab your transpose list and grab that up and put it as the colors. And then take the hues out and put those in as the values. As the values. There you go. And a little recomputation. <coughs> How'd it work for you? Is you okay? Um, I got the same error, but now nothing's changing. Like, I don't have the error anymore, but it hasn't changed. Okay, so let's see what's going on. Let's go to our, let's look at our hue values. Let's see what they are. So okay, got a good lot of good values there. Okay, I got height there. You got the parameter, the elements. Oh, I'll tell you what it is. It's that's the parameter name. Okay, and then we're gonna pull the elements up across. Yeah, I got the error, too. Okay, that is just having trouble creating something. It probably has something to do with the height, or it could be that you even have, just say delete, to, oh, it's, does your image have like a lot of either black or white in it? Mm -mm. There's something where it's just not able to create everything. Go ahead and just say cancel for it now. Let's try one other thing we're gonna do. Just sort of, okay, looks like you got some really interesting looking thing there. Yeah, okay. just <laughs> This is very cool. Okay, now that did okay. Mm -hmm. If if the values are just a little bit odd or you want to rescale them, let's see. There's another function. Let's see if I can find what it is. I think it's called range rescale. Let's see what range. Color, oh, remap range. I want to tell you about this function because it's another really good one. We have a list of values right now. They might be everywhere from 0 to 300. Like that. If we want to sort of contain that range a little bit, what you can do is use its map, map, remap the range, grab those values as numbers, then just sort of say what the new min and max is. So if you don't really want to go from 0 to 300 or something like that, what you can say is, oh, I just want to go from, let's say, 5, comma, to 20. Okay, then use those instead. What that list is going to be is just, it's going to take that range from 0 to 300 and just rescale the top and bottom, kind of compressing it into just a more acceptable range that you want to see. So you can pull those in as the values instead. And that's useful. It's useful for, on the one hand, if you have anything that has a value of 0, it's a way to get rid of that. But also, if you have 300, then it's just too extended. It sort of compresses it down there. What's that? Oh well, change your range. Well, you can know. you can scale up your range too. Maybe else. Question. Yes. So when does this render or something? Yes. Um, does it, the image actually show up? The shaded image shows up. So override color in view doesn't really give you a nice like a rendered image, a material image. Oh, okay. So we'd have to find some other way where we were like changing the material property or something like okay. that. Yes. Work with panels and try to make it work with panels, and it's continuously getting better. It, it should work with panels just the same. Like, uh, well, you're colorizing the panels. What do you? What, where's the error you're getting? So I guess the fact that it cannot work with seamless panels. Really? That's it. One other interesting. And like, well, go ahead. And like, <coughs> it seems like it's doing something. Or what is? Is it that the? Oh, well, you got height. Shoot the seamless rectangular panel. I'm just going to see you got the element coming across, you got the parameter name, you got the values coming down. That should be good. It's not giving us an error, so where does it tell you that? Or does it say that it can't create some elements of the type? Actually, I just hit cancel and then it's not giving me an error. It was giving me an error. Okay. 
Yeah, what happened for me even is when it's trying to create the panels, there's some points on the corners where the curvature is so great that it's not able to create the seamless rectangular panel. So it's kind of, that's what's failing. It's the creation of the revet. Actually, even here, can't make type rectangular exactly, that's the exact, okay. no worries. What that's telling you, that has more to do just for Revit and this range of values, it just can't create a panel given the parameters that's been fit. So it's not, your logic's perfect. It's just a matter of, we gotta go back and kind of think about the panel we're using and whether it can really accept those values. So, not to worry. For me, it's recreating them. For, you'll see what happens to me always is, it's always losing the last one. It's that one right on the corner. It just is have tr having trouble creating that. But it's not even giving me the different heights. And, uh, like it's just not doing anything. It's just getting. Well, interesting. <coughs> OK, so you go ahead and you set the heights. And it's anywhere from like 0 to, OK, let's take a look at your new values. Oh, you have all those zeros. Yeah, that's a problem. See, because so many of them are zeros right now, it has trouble with the idea of a height of zero, so maybe it's just barfing and like it's just stopping the operation. Why don't you do the rescale and rescale them so that zero is not in the range? So the lower will be 10 and the upper will be 100 or something like that. So take all your hue values and just go to math, remap, yeah, from 10 to 100. Okay, so put that in as the higher and the lower. And you take the numbers across. Yeah, the dice. Exactly. Yeah. And that's going to drop the zeros out. The zeros are a problem for revenue yeah. as a parameter. Thank you. Nice. Okay. You can have a lot of fun playing with this. Maybe use something like this as part of your uh, parametric structure. Let me go ahead and introduce you to one last thing. We won't get very far with it today, but let me just kind of show you the overall logic because it'll be useful for. Uh, what you're going to do with your own parametric structure. But we'll go through this in some more detail like on Tuesday together. <coughs> and that's really this example of creating a parametric stadium. And there's a lot of steps here. But let's just start with sort of the essential ones. It's really going to start with at a high level, we're going to, you know, it was almost like what I drew over here on the board for the bus shelter, where we have the four point uh, like truss that we're using. We're going to start by defining some arcs for the stadium. We're going to have a round stadium, so we're going to define some arcs. Okay. We're going to put some um, ribs. We're going to define some ribs, and what we're going to do there is place points on the arcs and then group the points so that we have collections of points that go up across the arc. So if you can think about it this way, we'll have these sort of different arcs. Okay, although. I leave them open on one side. Okay. And then for placing my trusses, what we're going to do is put, for example, 10 points on here, coming around. I'll put 10 points on each of the different curves. And then what we'll do is sort of start joining them. So that as we come up, we have what I'll call just collections of points that would be useful for placing the arcs. And then with this collection of points, we can place a truss. And the next one, you place a truss. And that's really what the first part of this is. So defining arcs, defining ribs, and then placing the trusses. Super. Yeah, there's some stuff in here about risers. We won't worry about that so much. But at a high level, it all starts by just defining these sort of points, collecting the points together, and then placing trusses based on that. Later on, we're going to go ahead and use those same points and say, hey, those would make a great surface and analyze the surface. Okay, a lot of stuff in there. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. We'll play with the object a little bit. And then you can even sort of take a look at some of the programming to sort of see. It might be a good example for when you get started. So if you can, go ahead and open up 6.3. And if you want to, even for the, open the one that says Revit Stadium <coughs> End. That might be a good one, because that actually sort of, uh, for what we're doing today, we give you the best idea of where we're going. Where is it? Stadium End, example Stadium End. Okay, and what we'll do is just 
show you some of the uh, introductory scripting to make this all happen. Finish, 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 finish. Looks like maybe it's going to flash in. Great. So let's show you what this little stadium looks like. This little stadium is really made up as a whole series of different circles. In some way, it goes like a pumpkin. And that circles are really defined as you can see on the trusses there, there's really four different placement points. So if I come on in here and oh, let's do it in red, there's a point right here, there's a point right here. There's actually, I am pretty sure it's the point right here and a point right here. So in order to place those little trusses going all the way around there, what I'm going to define is just a series of different circles with different radiuses and different heights that go around and then place points on there and then use those to go through and place the trusses. So that's really the high level in terms of what's going on. If you want to sort of see this thing in action though, you know, you can see that we've panelized it. Okay, that's what's going on over here. The size of the apertures is sort of based on, we'll learn how to do it next time. It's actually based on the position of the sun where the panels are going to, to the sun. So, where it's more sun, the apertures are smaller, the colors are brighter. Where there's less sun, like uh, the colors are darker, and the apertures are bigger, stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun you could have with this. But really, just to get started with it, let's go ahead and open up Dynamo, and we'll look at some of the very first steps, because that's kind of what you're going to do. And then, uh, I don't know, we'll finish it up next time. Close that up. Go back into Dynamo, and we'll just start with step one, start with A. Oops, wrong one. Try again. Open Dynamo. Step one A. Yeah, so actually, it'd be, maybe it's called step one. Let's see what it is. I don't know, I remember. So step one A, you find them all. Okay. Okay, so let's start with this. This is really all just going to start with a notion of really creating like different arcs, different arcs that we can work with. And in terms of these different arcs, oh, they have some different parameters. What we got going on here is for these different arcs, okay, we have kind of the let me think about it. The center point of the arc. And the center point is this going to be at zero zero. And that's the whole center point of our stadium. Super. So I can go ahead and pull that in. What I'm going to do is for all my different arcs, I have four different or I think this is only done with three. Let me check to make sure. We got a third point there. Let me just check to make sure what I did. I have a four point and I have a three point. I have to remember which one I used. It looks like the four point arc. Let's see what it is. Edit the type. That's four points. I'm just looking at my programming and sort of wondering. Okay. What I'm going to start with is just sort of heights and for the arc heights. I'm going to start with the lowest arc just being at zero. Then I have some different heights. This is sort of going up partway, the highest one, and it actually sort of wraps back down a little bit. And the reason I'm sort of doing that in terms of wrapping back down a little bit is just that the shape of the arc sort of comes over the top and sort of hooks just a little bit you know, down. So the shape of it just sort of lends itself so the fourth point's actually a little bit lower than the third point. So, I have collected and created just a series of different heights. 
This next part over here is just a different series of radiuses. So kind of narrow, getting fatter, getting narrower, and narrowest. Okay. And I'm going to take these different values and kind of ultimately like put them together like uh, and create some arcs. <coughs> So what I need to do is just go ahead and what I'm going to do for my center points, this is kind of an interesting thing. All the arcs are going to be centered at 0, 0, but their heights are going to change. The lowest arc will be at 0. The second arc will be a little higher. Okay. So what I'm going to do is create a series of different points okay, by saying they're all at 0, 0. But taking this list, and let's just do that. I'll do a little auto over here. Okay. Making for myself a series of different points at different heights. Okay. Those are going to be the centers. Okay. What I'm going to do is take this list of radiuses, pop it over here. Okay. That's going to be my radiuses for my arcs. And now we're ready to go through and just think about the starting and ending angle. With arcs, you always sort of get the ability to sort of, oh, this particular one, which lets center point radius and angle, gives you the ability to control that. They have one, which is just by the radius. So let's go ahead and make a complete circle. But this will basically say, what degree do you want to start at? What degree do you want to end at? So if I go 0 to 360, it'll be a full circle. <coughs> this is because you have opening. Exactly. But I'm going to go 0 to, I'm going to leave that as a nice parameter. I'm going to go currently to 180. I'll leave that as a parameter. Let's see what I got in here. Turn on my background preview. I might have to do a little zooming around. Let's kind of see where these all went. Do I see them? I don't see them now. Let's see what's going on. Do you see any arcs on yours? No. Okay. I wonder if it has to do with because I said manual after that. Let me go manual here and I'll say run it. Oh, yeah. Now you got some? What do I have going on here? Why do I not see them? They're kind of big. That's okay. Starting 0 to 180. That should be fine. Let me try going out again. It's still not. Interesting. She doesn't like me today, but that's okay. As long as it likes you. That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Let me also come back over here. Do, 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 background preview. The Revit background preview, too. Should be doing it there. Not sure why. Okay. The starting point is just creating those four different circles. You see four different circles? You're in good shape then. Your next step, <laughs> where we're going to go in step two of all this, is you're going to take those four different circles, those four different arcs, and you're going to divide them into a series of different placement points. Okay? And then finally, you might imagine we're going to transpose those placement points, Okay, because we're going to go, as opposed to going around the circle, we want to grab the first, second, and third, kind of create the columns, and put them together in different strings. Like, okay, so we can place those. So let's go ahead and just in the interest of time I'm going to go to 3a instead of 2a because 2a is where we put the point parameters in there take a look yeah up front here it's all still the same we have my beautiful like uh, arcs we go and run this Okay, now I got preview. I don't know why I did it before. Okay, what I'm going to do here is basically, you'll see I have my arcs. I'm going to do curve points at parameters. So that same issue of however many number of trusses you want, you put that many points. You're going to have one point for every truss that gets placed. So in my case, I set up a little slider over here for the number of trusses. 
I will create a whole collection of different placement points. And as beautiful as this collection of placement points is, the only problem is it goes around the circle as opposed to up the column. So I have to transpose it. And that'll say, as opposed to having these collections where all the points are on a single line, we'll group them by the four different points that are one on top of each other. So that's what the transpose does. Okay. And then all I really do is I say, great. Let's go ahead. This whole thing of NURBS curve by points is really just graphics. If I want to visualize those kind of collections and sort of see the addition of that curve, just see a nice curve to help me visualize, that's what the NURBS curve is doing. If you take that out, you'll see it disappears. But with those collection of four points, if you have collections of points, you can take them on down to the adaptive component. You can also say, hey, we need to tell it what kind of adaptive component to use. And we're going to grab the truss component, which is a four-point component, pull them across, and then when you run that, you'll get these trusses. <coughs> these trusses, which will hopefully now be kind of uh, working their way around the Coliseum or the stadium. So with those trusses in place, see where my example went. Looks like I've closed it by accident, which is uh, we're not going to bother you with. What you should see is that you now have a collection of different trusses out there. So now you can try doing things like changing oh the kind of width of the curves in terms of making it fatter or rescaling it. You can change the arcs in terms of making it longer or more closed. You can change the number of trusses that's going to occur along that. And if you're listening carefully and think back to assignment one, you might recognize those as being like the first three things you have to do for assignment one. So go ahead and if you can, let's break now. But go ahead and look at this example, like up to three or something like that. It'll give you a lot of good tips about how you might approach uh, the whole assignment one as you come up with your own interesting structures. Okay? So let us adjourn for today and uh, take a break. <laughs> <laughs>